Hey, I'm Zach, and I'm an instructor for the Friends of the Gallatin National Forest at Avalanche Center. In this video, we'll be covering mountain weather and how it relates to our avalanche problems. We'll touch on ways to help us better understand how to identify changing weather conditions both before our trip and while we're out in the backcountry. Throughout the winter, various storms create different layers in a seasonal snowpack. This layered snowpack is a key ingredient contributing to avalanches, and mountain weather, including snowfall, wind, and above freezing temperatures are also big players in this as well. Throughout this video, we'll cover each one of those three weather red flags individually. The first one we'll cover is snowfall. An important thing to remember with snowfall that generally speaking, more snow equals more avalanches. And while the amount of snow is what we really think about when, as skiers and riders, in the realm of avalanches, we're a lot more concerned with how much that new snow weighs. This is referred to as snow water equivalent, or if we filled a bucket up with that new snow and melted it down, how much water would be left over? So how much snow is equal to the water? This is important because if there are layers of weak snow within our layered snowpack, these weight layers can fail with this new weight causing large avalanches. Additionally, new snow may also bond poorly to the old snow surface, and that can pack enough punch to knock you off your feet or off your snow machine, or could even bury you. And a really important thing to note is that following these storm cycles, so following a big storm, we're more likely to see avalanches. So most of these avalanches that we're gonna encounter throughout a season, they're gonna occur during or directly after a storm. So keep in mind that even though it might be nice blue and sunny out there, there could still be a lingering instability uh, within our snowpack. We're gonna take a quick look at this video from a avalanche that happened in March of 2024 in Cook City. And this is a really good example of that new snow creating large avalanches following a large snow event. Quite a large avalanche. Now, if we take a little excerpt from that day's avalanche forecast from the Gallatin National Forest Avalanche Center, we can pull out a little bit key information to help understand why this large avalanche happened and why there was an associated high danger rating with that day. So a couple of key things here we can see is that this, since the beginning of this storm cycle, 3.6 to 4.7 inches of snow water equivalent or about four to five feet of snow fell. And another component we can pull out of that is that it was also accompanied by wind. So we had a large weather event that deposited a lot of snow, adding a lot more weight to a weak snowpack. And we saw a widespread cycle of both natural avalanches as well as human triggered avalanches. So we'll focus next on that wind component from this little excerpt. And wind is really that next red flag. And we're gonna spend a little bit talking about wind and there's a few things we can think about. So wind direction can help us understand where recent snowfall is being blown to. And ridge lines are a great indicator of this. So this will give you a prevailing wind direction where one side may be scoured and the other side will be covered in snow. The scoured side is often called the windward side or the side facing the wind. And the side where the snow is being deposited is called the leeward side or the sheltered side from the wind. As wind will transport snow, that usually happens about 10, at about 10 miles an hour and can actually deposit snow three to five times faster than snow falling from the sky. And so similar to heavy snowfall, this will increase the amount of weight on a potentially weak snowpack. Further, wind transported snow can be compacted into a stiff slab that can create an avalanche problem on its own called a wind slab. And a lot of times these avalanches will catch people off guard 
and we can use visual clues to help identify slopes that might have been uh, impacted by winds in that area. In this photo, we can pull a few clues that can help us better key into the potential avalanche problems. First obvious one is that there's an avalanche in the center of the photo. So there you go. That's pretty solid bullseye data. However, if that did not exist, we can use a couple clues on this slope to help decide if wind has affected this area. So the first thing we can see is a large cornice that's forming above our slope. And that's likely forming with a wind coming from the backside, and that side might be scoured, also called the windward side, and depositing snow on the leeward side, giving us that cornice formation. Additionally, we can look at this slope and identify other features within here that could possibly harbor an avalanche problem like a wind slab. If we take a look at this gully, we can see that there's a dip in there and that could hold snow and could be a good deposition area for some snow. And the type of wind that can cause that would be cross loading. So if instead of the wind blowing up and over the backside of the ridgeline, it's gonna be blowing across the slope, depositing snow into that gully and could create avalanches like the one in this photo. The last thing that we can key into is if we're looking at this slope and we can see there's a textured snow surface, that means that at some point in time, that wind came through and changed the snow surface. So if it's not that nice, plainer, fresh snow look, and we can see these ripples or pillows, that's a good indicator that wind has come through that area. The last red flag we're gonna to touch on is gonna be above freezing temperatures. Now, rapid warming can cause the snowpack to melt and lose strength, resulting in anywhere from small to large avalanches, depending on the duration of that warming. Oftentimes, these periods of warming are kind of preceded by a few indicators like roller balls. So if you see roller balls or roller balls are coming off of your machine or your skis or your board, it's a good indicator that the snow surface has become wet and saturated and it is time to seek different slopes. Now, when we have really long extended periods of above freezing temperatures, so roughly more than 24 hours of these non-freezing temperatures, they can create dangerous avalanche conditions where avalanches can be large in size and quite destructive. If we take a look at this photo taken in Beehive Basin in the spring, we can see that we have a few indicators of that wet snow surface. So we have some roller balls and a couple small avalanches that are likely wet snow avalanches. So that's a good indicator that the snow surface has become wet and that the snowpack is losing strength. Now, if these conditions persist for long periods of time and we have a weak uh, layer of snow within our seasonal snowpack, that can create these very large avalanches like this photo taken on Republic Peak outside of Cook City. So we can see that that is a very large avalanche and this occurred later in the spring after that meltwater had gone through our seasonal snowpack, eventually reaching a weak layer, ultimately causing this large avalanche. Along those lines of above freezing temperatures, midwinter rain or early spring or spring rain can occur. It's not that common in southwestern Montana. It might be more common in an area like the Pacific Northwest, but you can think of it as adding a lot of weight and water to our snowpack. So we're kind of getting both of those problems like heavy, heavy weight on a weak snowpack as well as liquid water being introduced into that snowpack. So it'll rapidly increase the weight on a weak snowpack. It can also introduce that liquid water, like how melting would happen to de to take away the strength of our seasonal snowpack. So these have all been kind of indicators in the field or sort of like a broad overview of different red weather red flag information. But there are a few things that we can do before we even leave the house. So before we get out, we can check the weather. That's a really simple way to start your day. So you can check your weather and you can also read the weather section of your local avalanche forecast. So weather.gov is a great place to start 
where you can get a point forecast for the area that you'll be recreating in that day. And within that point forecast, we can pull out some of those key red flag, uh, weather red flag information. So we can pull out that we might have a chance of above freezing temperatures. We can look at our wind speeds and see if we have those high wind speeds, as well as we can look at how much precipitation that we'd be seeing that day. It's important to remember that this is a forecast for the day. If you were wanted to look at what happened in the last 24 hours or overnight, you can look at your local avalanche center's avalanche forecast. So this is a daily avalanche forecast that is provided by the forecasters at the Gallatin National Forest Avalanche Center. And within that, we'll have a small uh, mountain weather section that will outline the last 24 hours of snowfall, wind, and temperature, as well as an outlook for the day ahead across the region. So again, we can pull out some of that key information to, to let us know what might be happening in the mountains. So whether it's a lot of snow, so a lot of weight added to a potentially weak snowpack, some snow accompanied by some wind, or in the springtime, above freezing temperatures or sustained above freezing temperatures. While we're in the field, we can just remember to keep our eyes peeled for those three weather red flags. So if we're out in the field and it's snowing heavily, we can expect that our danger is going to increase and the likelihood of triggering an avalanche will increase as well. If we're walking around ridgelines or near or above tree line and we're feeling strong winds or seeing actively blowing snow, those are also really good indicators that we could see some wind slab problems or a potential uh, avalanche happening deeper in our snowpack. And while we're walking around in the spring, we can keep an eye out for those roller balls or we're sinking to our boots when we get off our off out of our skis or off our snow machine. And that's just another good indicator that that snow surface has become warm and wet. So we are going to want to seek different terrain and avoid those warm slopes. Now, it's important to just stay alert to these changing conditions. And the more you stay alert to these changing conditions, the more you can tailor your trip plan and your terrain management to better match the type of weather that you're gonna encounter in the field that day. And also better understand what types of avalanche problems you could encounter out there. Thanks for watching and I hope you have a great winter and stay safe out there. I'm gonna go with that one's good.